For many older football fans, the last 15 to 20 years have been tough. Football has changed a lot, with each year that has passed it has gained exposure and though it's hard to pinpoint the source of these changes, it's undeniable they occurred. Back in the 80s, though the weight of tactics can't be undermined too much, football players enjoyed a much higher degree of freedom on the pitch. There was more space for fantasy, more space for individual brilliance and if there is one symbol for that era, it definitely is the classic number 10. The number 10 controlled the tempo of the match, he was most likely the most talented player on the pitch. They were true, real-life wizards, acting out real magic on the pitch. So much was their prevalence that in a way the other players were quite simply expected to cater to his needs. The team depended on a single man's genius to perform. Perhaps that was the reason they slowly died out. There was one player that lived out the final days of this mythical role, becoming the encore to a show that had lasted for decades. He performed as the crowds left, but he kept performing. Today, I'm going to tell you about the life of a player who became the final string, holding classic football in its place, a man born in the wrong decade, the last of a dynasty. Today, I'm going to tell you, or for the ones who witnessed all of this, I'm going to try my best to make justice to Juan Román Riquelm. His life in a way seemed like a prophecy. Like many Argentinian legends, he was born in Buenos Aires to a very poor and large family. Just one day before Argentina won the World Cup and in the same year as Boca Juniors won their second consecutive Copa Libertadores. It's like he was born on time to see what he was expected to deliver one day. If that might feel like a tiny coincidence, let me ask you something. If I told you about a young boy from Buenos Aires who would get spotted by Argentinos Juniors and would climb to the ranks displaying incredible prowess with a ball at his feet and with the fabled number 10 on his back, eventually joining Boca Juniors, becoming a club legend and earning himself a move to Europe, joining Barcelona where, after some trouble he would decide to leave and play for a smaller team, who would I be talking about? Obviously Maradona, right? Except I could word by word also be talking about Riquelm. It's freaky how similar their paths were at first sight, almost like he was supposed to be the heir to his throne. But let's leave all that to the side and focus on Riquelme for a while. His time at Argentinos Juniors would not last very long. After three seasons playing at the youth level, both River Plate and Boca Juniors were looking to sign him. In the end, he would choose Boca, who had been his favorite club since his childhood. Though it should be noted, the $800,000 paid for a teenager who hadn't even debuted for the first team were also quite appealing, I suppose. At the age of 18 he would debut at the Primera División. The season would go on really well, he seemed to be fitting right in at a time where Boca needed a player like him since Diego Maradona himself, who was one of Riquelme's teammates, was out due to positive drug tests. Regardless, after a managerial change and despite how well Riquelme was playing, as Maradona came back there was no dispute. Riquelme was being left out of the team. Then, tragedy would fall upon Boca, as the next season started, Maradona would test positive once again and retire. In a weird way, these were the best possible news to Riquelme, who would get his spot back soon after. If the previous season had been disastrous, this one would be already substantially better, but it would only be in 1998-1999, once the Maradona drama was left far behind by everyone, that they would once again win the Torneo de Apertura, the first time in six years. The following season, things would only get better, this time the focus would be the Copa Libertadores. The group stage would be a breeze, three straight wins, and they were onto the knockout stages. Their first matchup would be El Nacional, and after a first leg draw, it would be Riquelme who would open the score sheet as they would go on to qualify, but then they would get drawn with their biggest enemies, River Plate, and from then on, it was showtime. River Plate would score first and though Riquelme would balance the score, it wouldn't be enough as Saviola would give River Plate the first leg win. Rumors were going around that the team lacked motivation, people seemed to believe they wouldn't be able to turn the game around in the second leg, and if they needed extra motivation, their coach Carlos Bianchi had the answer. Martin Palermo he was one of the team's key players and had been out injured for six months and though he wasn't yet fully fit, no one needed to know that. So Bianchi 
started telling the press that Palermo was coming back in time for the second leg. The fans were hyped, the team was hyped. Even though as the match started he would be on the bench, Palermo would be incredible. Motivating the team from the sidelines, the mood completely changed. La Bombonera was exploding with euphoria as Boca kept pouncing on a River Plate that was seemingly stunned by their attitude. By the 86th minute, Riquelme would convert the penalty to make it 2 0 and to further carve this super classico in history, Palermo would join them for the last few minutes and still manage to make it 3 0. After easy wins over America, they would be on to the final, facing a Palmeiras squad that was at the time coached by Luis Flip Scolari. The first match would see Boca go in front twice, with Palmeiras coming back to hold them to a draw every time. Actually, the first time Palmeiras tied the match, the goal scorer would be Pena who the following year would join FC Porto and is an interesting player to me. My father has always told me he was the first player I ever liked. Apparently as a young child I learned how to yell out his name whenever he scored and it just became sort of a family joke here. But regardless, as I was saying, the second match would end goalless and they'd be forced onto penalties and though Riquelme would trip himself, he would still convert his as Boca won the Copa Libertadores for the first time since 1978. This was enough, Riquelme was a Boca legend, he could leave, it wasn't like he lacked the offers, but he would stay and the following season would be incredible. He would start by leading the way as Boca defeated Real Madrid to win the Intercontinental Cup. And then Boca would go on a tear at the Copa Libertadores once again, this time not losing a single match in the whole tournament up until the final, where they would meet Cruz Azul, who they defeat 1-0 in the first leg, only to see the same result be flipped onto them in the second leg as they were once more forced to go into the penalty shootout, and once more Riquelme would convert his as he launched the team into yet another Copa Libertadores. By the end of the year, Riquelme would win every award imaginable in South America. If he had been elected, to the Ballon d'Or, who knows what would have happened. I'm not saying he'd win it, but I'm also not saying that it would be far from it, especially considering that year Michael Owen won it despite only ranking 7th in the FIFA's Player of the Year award. So really, who knows? His last year at Boca would be pretty dreadful. The board would clash with Riquelme and the coach Carlos Bianchi, who would leave. Riquelme's performances would decrease in quality and he would even protest against the board by celebrating in front of their cabin as he blocked his ears with both his hands. Soon after, he would finally take the jump and pick one of Europe's greatest clubs. His pick would be FC Barcelona, who were in a way, as you might imagine, expecting him to hold up to the standard Maradona had created. The transfer would be achieved for just 9 million pounds, an absolute bargain. Or at least, it would have been if it wasn't handled in the worst way possible. Among all of this, Riquelme would be going through some crazy times. Normally, he would have joined Argentina to take part in the 2002 World Cup, but some problems with Marcelo Bielsa, coupled with the fact that his brother was being held for ransom by kidnappers in Argentina, made it so he would stay behind. Quite a messy time for Riquelme. And it would only get worse as from the get-go Van Gaal would marginalize Riquelme at Barcelona, claiming he was a political signing and even as the Argentinian managed three goals in his first four starts for the club, Van Gaal just kept benching him over and over again. By the end of the season, he managed around 45 minutes of playing time per match played. His dream signing turned into a nightmare and honestly, if there has ever been a player who needed to be handled like a fragile piece of jewelry, it was Riquelme. He was a genius, but he was also moody and that made him inconsistent. If you wanted Riquelme to perform, you needed to pair him with a coach that would make him feel valued, and they didn't, at all. So after just one season, he was out. Ronaldinho's signing had taken the last spot for non-EU players and that was it for Riquelme. As you might imagine, this season turned a lot of fans against Riquelme, but some admirers still watched from afar, and one of them was Benito Floro, the Villarreal coach. Benito understood what was needed to get the best out of Riquelme and he was willing to offer him the world in exchange for some magic on the pitch, so Riquelme joined him. Though the team's results domestically wouldn't be the most inspiring, Riquelme would start performing once again and the fans would adore him. By February, Benito Flora would decide it was pointless to continue coaching the squad and resign. 
perhaps if he had stayed just a few more matches, the team's win over Galatasaray would have inspired him to continue, but it didn't, and he got to watch from home as Villarreal nearly made it to the final of the UEFA Cup after defeating Roma and Celtic as well. They were just one goal short of making an insane comeback, but sadly Valencia made it to the final instead. Perhaps if Benito had stayed and the second coach hadn't been forced to take over, it would have been an incredible year for Villarreal. Regardless, the following year, as Pellegrini began coaching the team and Diego Forlan arrived at the club following some less fortunate times at Manchester United, a revolution would start. Remember that Villarreal already possessed some quality players such as Pep Reina in goal and Marco Senna in the midfield. They would start by winning the Intertoto Cup so they could qualify to the UEFA Cup, but this time it would be locally that they would shine the brightest, managing a third place finish in La Liga, the best in the club's history as Diego Forlan managed to top the goal scoring shots with 24 goals, but by the end of the year, as both managed to get nominated to the Ballon d'Or, it would be Riquelme who would place higher in the voting. Over the summer, he would go back to playing with the national team, taking part in the Confederations Cup. They would make it all the way, only to be stopped by Brazil, whose front four, comprised of Kaká, Ronaldinho, Adriano and Rubinho, would make Argentina look like a bunch of amateurs, defeating them 4-1. The following season would be one hell of a ride, let me tell you. It all went down in the Champions League. Villarreal would not lose a single match of the group stage, even as Riquelme missed both matches against Manchester United. Being first in their group, they would get the easy draw playing against Rangers in the first leg in Glasgow, Riquelme would put Villarreal in front twice, first with a goal and then with an assist. But it wouldn't be enough and the match would end as a two-goal draw. At home, they scrapped a one-goal draw and went through on away goals. This time things would be much tougher as they had to face Inter Milan and though Forlan would score in the first minute, by the seventh Adriano had tied the match and eventually Inter would win 2-1. The second leg at El Madrigal would be a much quieter match, but once again Riquelme would get the assist as Villarreal scored the only goal of the match and once again took advantage of the away goals rule to get through. Villarreal were now somehow into the semi-finals of the Champions League, even though this was the first time in their history taking part in the competition. For a second, there was hope that Riquelme and Forlan would perform a miracle and though the match at Highbury would end in a 1-0 win to Arsenal at Hel Madrigal, the fans thought maybe it would be different. And well, it was a tough match, no goal for 89 minutes. Arsenal goalkeeper Le Man was having a wonderful performance, but then came a penalty for Villarreal. The deciding moment, and of course all hopes laid at Riquelme's feet. He approached the penalty area and looked Le Man in the eye. It seemed maybe everything was gonna be alright, but then he missed. The greatest moment of his career, and he missed. Villarreal were out of the Champions League and after just 16 more matches for Villarreal and as tensions started building up between the player and the board, Riquelme would leave the club as well. You might be wondering what went wrong. So far it might seem like a match made in heaven, but well, Riquelme wanted everything from the club and then a bit more. It drained when he pleased, he spent more time in Argentina than in Spain, he even refused to play quite often and he was never used as a sub. Other Argentine players were brought just to keep him company, but he still asked for more and more and one day he asked for the absurd, to not train ever again. Some claim he was sabotaging his own career, so he'd be forced to go back to Argentina to keep company to his dying mother. Some say he was quite simply a spoiled brat. Some say he was a fragile young man who couldn't bear the distance between him and his loved ones. But what seems to be the core of this situation is that he was simply too weak mentally to become the legend we expected him to be. So he packed his bags and headed back to Boca Juniors and though it's easy to dismiss this as a horrible decision, since the player was only 29 years old, he would go on to have one of the best seasons of his career. The focus would be the Copa Libertadores. Having already won it twice, he was just one short of becoming the player to have won the most, equaling five of his teammates from 2001 who had stayed and added a third one to their cabinet in 2003, as well as three other Brazilian players who had done it in the 90s. But still there was one problem to that record. Three of those players were playing alongside Riquelme, which meant that as long as he won it, so would they, maintaining themselves ahead of him, but regardless, still an impressive landmark 
mark to achieve. In a group stage, Riquelme would get a single goal across the three matches, but then things got serious and seriously impressive. Riquelme opened the score sheet against Vélez Sarsfield with a great curl into the right pocket, but then he would have the opportunity to score the second through a penalty, but Palermo would take it instead and miss, though he would redeem himself by scoring an impressive header for the second goal. To win the match, Riquelme would put a true ball onto Rodriguez, would make it 3-0. In the second leg, Vélez Sarsfield would get three goals back, but a goal by Riquelme midway through the match would be enough to save them from disaster. The first leg of the quarterfinal match against Libertad would be drawn out till the 81st minute, where finally Libertad would score and go in front, but luckily in injury time, Riquelme would force a penalty in the area and Palermo would convert it, making the final score a one-goal draw. The second leg score sheet would be opened with a phenomenal goal by Riquelme with a frenetic run all the way from midfield up till the edge of the box where a low shot would give Boca a lead. They would hold on to all the way till the final whistle. In the semi-finals against Cucuta Deportivo, Boca would go in front only to end up losing 3-1 by the end of the match. They were in need of a miracle in the second leg and they need one even more as the game approached halftime and no goals had been scored yet, but then, of course, to light the fuse, Riquelme would score an impressive free kick to reduce the gap between the two teams. Then, a goal by Palermo would put Boca in front by the way goals rule, but still the comeback wasn't fully formed until Riquelme assisted Bataglia through a corner kick to put Boca three goals in front and take them to the Copa Libertadores final once more. In the final, they would face Grêmio, and they would quite simply wipe the floor with them. With a free kick, Riquelme would set up the first goal, then, with another free kick, he would get the second goal, and then, one of his long shots would lead to a rebound that would catch the opposition unprepared as Boca went in front by three goals. There was quite simply no need for a second leg, but still, it had to be played, and Riquelme would enjoy it a lot. Scoring two more goals, the first a ridiculous strike from a tight angle, and a second one a rebound after the keeper failed to complete the save. Riquelme had just been involved in 10 goals in 8 knockout stage matches, that's nearly 60% of all goals scored by Boca. These incredible performances, though not enough to make him the top scorer of the competition, were enough to make him the best player in the tournament. Over summer, he once more went back to play with Argentina, taking part in only his second ever Copa America. He would start by getting an assist against the United States as they beat them 4-1. Then two goals against Colombia would be essential as they won 4-2. Already qualified to the knockout stage, Argentina would play against Paraguay without Riquelme. In the quarterfinals, Riquelme scored another two and even assisted Lionel Messi as he would score the other goal. Then a 3-0 win over Mexico with another goal and another assist by Riquelme and they were on to the final. With a young Lionel Messi by his side, as well as Carlos Tevez, Verón, Cambiasso, Mascherano, Diego Milito and Zanetti, there surely couldn't be a way they wouldn't win this, except that in the final, a Brazilian starting eleven whose best players were Robinho, Julio Batista and Maicon, somehow managed to embarrass Argentina with a 3-0 win. Honestly, not even I can tell you what happened that day. The following year, the highlight of the season would once again be his time with the national team, this time taking part in the Olympic Games, which are just kind of a weird tournament, regardless the toughest matches would come in the quarters and semi-finals, where Argentina would beat the Netherlands and then Brazil as Riquelme scored the third goal before beating Nigeria in the final. As much as the credibility of the tournament may be questioned, it's still an extra trophy in his cabinet. He would retire from international football in 2010 after some problems he had with Maradona, who was the national team coach at the time. In 2012, Boca would once again make it very far in the Copa Libertadores. In a group stage, Riquelme would seem in good form, getting one goal and two assists in five matches played. Then he would be involved in four goals in the two legs of the last 16 matches, but that was about it for goal contributions in that tournament. Still, they would make it to the final, where Corinthians would defeat them 3-1 on aggregate. By 2015, Riquelme would finally leave Boca to join Argentinos Juniors for what would be his last ever season as a professional football player, and just like that, classical football came to an end. 
I get lots of people on this channel who question my methods regarding the way I rank the players because truthfully, what makes a great player? Is it trophies? Is it a lot of goals? Is it the beauty of those goals? Well, it's something different to each one of us. I created a system so I'd be forced to be as fair as possible. Many were the times in which the score I gave a player wasn't what I thought it truly deserved, but well, it is what it is. Riquelme had some serious weak spots to his game and his career isn't the most perfect, but I can tell you something, people love him, and that's what matters the most. In his prime, Riquelme was an astonishing playmaker, one of the best we've seen. He didn't need to be strong or fast or as much as that might seem like an awful trait for a footballer, he didn't even need to work hard or care much about the game. When he touched the ball, magic happened and it was beautiful. That was Riquelme, not a machine made to win games, but a piece of art, a drama at the very least. Now, getting into the ranking system. First, finishing. Exceptional free kick taker, beautiful goals, but definitely not the most prolific. It's an 8 out of 10. Then, playmaking. It was just on another level, a 10 out of 10. Dribbling was insane as well, this man could get out from being in the middle of like 5 defenders so easily, it honestly seems like magic, it's a 10 out of 10. But now we gotta get into the nasty part, speed and physicality were just really unimpressive, a 6 out of 10. Mentality was nearly laughable, no work ethic and no mental strength, I could go on but... Well, considering his vision, he gets bumped up a bit, I guess, so it's a 6 out of 10. Longevity and adaptability was a mixed bag, he played at a high level for a long time, but he struggled a lot in his time in Europe, not exactly with a difference in the game, but with gathering motivation to play, it's a 7 out of 10. Flair is easily a 10 out of 10, no question. Trophy cabinet is a unique case, he didn't win any trophies in Europe besides the two Intertoto Cups with Villarreal, but with Boca it was incredible, 3 Copa Libertadores is extremely impressive, when you add that to an Intercontinental Cup and a few minor international trophies, well, it's at least an 8 in my book. Finally, the icon factor, and though in Europe he has been kind of forgotten sometimes, well, in certain places, Riquelme is one of the biggest South American legends of the last decade, especially in his homeland Argentina. To Boca fans, it wouldn't be that crazy to question who you preferred, Maradona or Riquelme, and to all of that, he gets a 9 out of 10. This totals out to 74 out of 90, level with Gheorghe Agi, which makes a lot of sense to me at least. Still, don't forget you can vote for his X Factor to influence his final score, and yeah, this video was made in advance so there's no X Factor of the previous week to show, and well, this was Riquelme's career, wait, Juan Roman Riquelme's career in a video. I hope you enjoyed, if you didn't forget to like and subscribe if you're new, it really means the world to me, like, for real. I love making these videos, I love this channel, it's like the greatest thing that has happened to me in a long time, so yeah. Thanks for being here and I'll see you next week, bye.